Good afternoon. I'm David Van Slyke, and I have the privilege to serve as the Dean of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. First, I would like to thank Bethany Wallwender for her leadership and project management and the entire Maxwell Dean's office for their tremendous support. Tom Fazio and the Maxwell Information and Computing Team, Scott Casanova, Rebecca Lemunyan, Ralph Meets, Becky Brzezinski, Mike Dugan, and the student engagement team at the Shine Student Center. Our interpreters, Sally Marano for live transcription, the learning environment and media production team, the team at the NBRC, Mike Haney, the IVMF, our government relations team, the public safety team, and the academic affairs team. The Maxwell School is the only academic institution in the country with citizenship in its title and mission. Our values embrace free speech in exchange of ideas and an intolerance of intolerance and of those that would marginalize and dehumanize others. Our reverence for others, intellectual humility, modeling dignity, and embracing diversity make us a school that cares deeply about ideas, evidence, and working across all levels of government and all sectors of our economy to make a, pos a positive difference for the public good. As such, we are committed to fostering civil dialogue and meaningful exchanges in an increasingly polarized society. We believe in the right to protest as much as the right to free critical inquiry, and part of that is being willing to listen to each other. We are lucky to be at an institution where many different political and intellectual perspectives can be heard. We ask that you be respectful of this event, of our participants and guests. In the Maxwell School courtyard, there is an iconic statue of Abraham Lincoln by James Earl Fraser. This statue is meaningful to me as an expression of the importance, as well as the burdens of public service and citizenship. Lincoln lived in a turbulent period in American history, when there was a real question of whether or not the country would survive. Throughout the Civil War, he was guided by two fundamental beliefs. The first was that all men are created equal, and the second was in the wisdom of ordinary people. At Gettysburg, Lincoln challenged Americans to dedicate themselves to values of equality and freedom, and to preserving government of the people by the people and for the people. Today, we find a polarized environment characterized less and less by debate, dialogue, and exchange, and more by a culture of contempt in which understanding is no longer a North Star by which we seek to engage one another in respectful ways. Rather, in daily life, in public media, in private conversations, we experience a weaker commitment to ideas and sharing in each other's humanity. Instead, for many individuals, they impose and weaponize value judgments that not only break down friendships, but they succumb to dogmatic groupthink and rigidity that undermines the common good. Alexis de Tocqueville the French diplomat, historian, and political scientist, is best known to Americans for his book, Democracy in America, in which he chronicles his observations on civil and political society. He notes, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. In that spirit, please allow me to roadmap today's program. I will first introduce Provost Gretchen Ritter and Professor Sean O'Keefe. Professor Sean O'Keefe will introduce our distinguished guest. Representative Cheney will first offer brief remarks and then join the provost for a conversation. 
you were offered an opportunity to submit questions. I will then ask a representative set of questions to Representative Cheney from those that were submitted by our audience today after her interview with the provost. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Vice Chancellor, Provost, and Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Gretchen Ritter. <laughs> provost Ritter came to Syracuse University in October of 2021 from The Ohio State University, where she was the Executive Dean of Arts and Sciences and Vice Provost. Prior to OSU, Dr. Ritter was the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University, and before that was a professor of political science and vice provost of undergraduate education and faculty governance at the University of Texas at Austin. A political scientist by training with her doctorate from MIT, Provost Ritter is a scholar of the history of women's constitutional rights and contemporary issues concerning democracy and citizenship in American politics. Provost Ritter is the recipient of several fellowships and awards, including a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, the Radcliffe Research Partnership Award, and a Liberal Arts Fellowship at Harvard Law School. She is a member of the American Political Science Association and the Council on Foreign Relations. We are so delighted that she can participate today in this event and the academic leadership that she brings to Syracuse University. I would now like to introduce my friend, colleague, and Maxwell alum, Professor Sean O'Keefe, whose professional, personal, and avocational pursuits have been dedicated to public service. Professor O'Keefe is a university professor, the highest faculty rank conferred by the university, and he also holds the Howard and Louise Fansteel Chair in Leadership. He is also a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Among his different professional positions, Professor O'Keefe has served as Secretary of the Navy, Deputy Assistant to President George W. Bush, Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget at the White House, NASA Administrator, the Chancellor of LSU, and the CEO of Airbus. Professor O'Keefe has received many awards, including in 1993, when President George H.W. Bush and Secretary Dick Cheney presented him the Distinguished Public Service Award. His other awards include the Department of Navy's Public Service Award, five honorary doctorates, including from Loyola University of New Orleans, his undergraduate alma mater, the Syracuse University Chancellor's Award for Public Service, the Syracuse University Distinguished Alumni Errants Award presented for excellence in public service, and the Meridian International Center's Corporate Leadership Award. A devoted volunteer to many public, nonprofit, academic, and faith-based organizations, Professor O'Keefe is also a popular professor and consummate student mentor and I am grateful for the many ways he has served our nation and Syracuse University. Sean, please come to the podium and introduce this afternoon's distinguished guest. Thank you, Dean Van Slyke, um, for that overly generous introduction. It is indeed a pleasure to co-host this event with you and to serve under your leadership as a Syracuse University Maxwell School. At the conclusion of my introduction, our honored guest and the provost uh, will join on the stage in particular to begin that conversation that the dean referred to. This afternoon, it is my privilege to welcome our distinguished guest to Syracuse University's campus. She's an attorney, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, served as the third ranking Republican in the United States House of Representatives, and presently the Congresswoman for Wyoming. She is a member of the House Armed Services Committee and the Vice Chair of the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th 2021 attack on the United States Capitol. 
It is particularly meaningful that she has taken the time to visit with us today. Syracuse University, as you heard from the dean, is the oldest school of public affairs in the nation, founded just short of a century ago as the Maxwell School of Citizenship. Public affairs was added later. It is dedicated to the proposition that Americans not only enjoy the inalienable rights enshrined in the principles declared at our nation's founding, but also the responsibility to preserve those principles to the benefit of the generations that follow. To remind us that the duty of the Maxwell School is to focus our labor, to pass along the means to preserve both citizen rights and responsibilities, as the Dean mentioned, a statue of Abraham Lincoln serves as the sentinel at the entrance to the Maxwell School complex. During our nation's 250 years engaged in this great experiment of democracy, Lincoln presided at an extraordinary threat to the continuation of our unique form of citizen governance. He clearly summarized his challenge in 1861, just a month before he was inaugurated and before the first shots of the Civil War were fired. He observed, I am exceedingly anxious that this union, the Constitution, and the liberties of the people shall be perpetuated in accordance with the original idea for which that struggle was made. And I shall be most happy indeed if I shall be the humble instrument for perpetuating the object of that great struggle. It is within this context that this is a particularly unique occasion for us to welcome a remarkable public servant who has literally lived up to the oath of office to preserve these principles and recited by all those who have ever had the opportunity to serve the citizens of the United States in any public capacity. And that is always to protect and defend the Constitution. Indeed, she has taken the oath to a substantially higher standard. We are in a time in our history characterized by great division and domestic tensions that are rising. In our time, this has proven to be another test of our uniquely American experiment. Our honored guest today has embraced the ideals of the Maxwell vision of citizenship and has become the modern example of what Lincoln called the humble instrument for perpetuating the object of that struggle. By doing so, she has self and selfishly and selflessly suborned her future and any aspirations she may have harbored, and instead acted on the anchor of our governance principles to address the rule of law, and thereby has demonstrated courage in defense of democracy. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce the Honorable Liz Cheney. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is uh, it's wonderful uh, to be here, wonderful to have the, the chance uh, to be with my uh, old friend, Sean O'Keefe, um, and, and to be here uh, to talk about citizenship and to talk about uh, citizenship here at the Maxwell School um, it, with the provost is particularly um, important and, and I'm honored to be able to do so. Uh, I wanted to uh, start today, um, before we go into questions, uh, to talk about the topic of citizenship 
and uh, to talk about it in particular by um, taking everyone back to the night of January 6th. And on the night of January 6th, um, as the House uh, was getting ready to reconvene, uh, I had the uh, opportunity, I wanted to see, as we got back onto the House floor, uh, I wanted to see what the condition was, what the circumstances were in uh, Statuary Hall and in the Capitol Rotunda after the day of, of, uh, of the attack. And so I walked off the House floor and I walked first into Statuary Hall. And Statuary Hall, as many of you probably know, was uh, the first place that the House of Representatives met uh, before the House chamber was built. And on the floor of Statuary Hall, there are brass plaques that designate the locations of the desks of presidents who served uh, in the House. And so there's a plaque that designates where Abraham Lincoln's desk sat when he was a House member. Uh, there's another plaque for John, John Quincy Adams' desk. And it's also the place where um, a number of statues uh, representing different states line the walls. And on the night of January 6th, as I walked into Statuary Hall, leaning up against every statue were members of the SWAT team, members of the National Guard, members of the ATF um, in riot gear, uh, exhausted because they had spent the day engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, with our fellow citizens, and because they had spent the day defending the Capitol building and defending our democratic process of counting electoral votes. And I walked around uh, Statuary Hall and I, I thanked them for what they'd done, but there were not words to express um, the emotion of the fact that they'd had to engage in that, that battle. Uh, and then I walked from Statuary Hall into the Capitol Rotunda itself. And when you leave Statuary Hall, you walk underneath the oldest statue in the Capitol. And it's a statue of Cleo, who is the muse of history. And in this statue, Cleo rides in a chariot, the chariot of time, and she has a book in her hands, and she's writing in the book. And Cleo is there to remind members of the House, she was put there when the House met in Statuary Hall, to remind us that what we do is recorded in the pages of history, and to remind us of our obligations and of our duties. And when you walk under Cleo, you walk through a hall into uh, the rotunda itself. And this is a place where presidents lie in state. Uh, this is a place where the statues of, uh, of Grant, of Washington, uh, of Eisenhower, of Reagan, uh, of, of our presidents line the halls. And again, in the rotunda on the night of the 6th were armed men who had defended the nation, who defended the Capitol from that attack. And the message of citizenship is perhaps clearest in the rotunda in many ways, but there are paintings along the walls of the rotunda by George Trumbull. And one of them is a painting that depicts George Washington when he handed back command of the Continental Army. Uh, when he basically said he would relinquish command, when he began the tradition and the history uh, in our nation of a peaceful transfer of power. And every single president of the United States, every one, has honored that duty, has treated it as sacred, except for one. 
And as we think about what does it mean to be citizens in this republic, what are the duties, what are the obligations, and what are the blessings, um, I think that it's important for all of us, not just those of us who are elected, but for all of us to understand the sacred nature of a peaceful transition of power and, and what that means to the perpetuation of our republic, what it means in this country, um, and, and what it means to young people. As I uh, have uh, thought about my own responsibilities and duties and those of all of us over the last year and a half in particular, uh, I think often about my children and I think about young people across this country. And if there is one thing um, above all others that we have to dedicate ourselves to, it's to the recognition that this republic only survives if individuals step forward to defend her. Those who make the biggest and most important sacrifice are the men and women in uniform who protect us. Um, but all of us, every single one of us, has a duty to make sure that this isn't the last generation that knows the peaceful transfer of power in this great nation. And I'm absolutely committed to doing everything I can to make sure um, that that is the case. And, and I hope that all of you, especially the young people and the students who are here today, um, will, will leave today um, understanding and recognizing what a tremendous blessing it is that we get to live in a place where we get to make decisions about our government and our laws, um, but what a, what a tremendous duty and responsibility of citizenship that, that imposes on all of us. Um, and it's a duty that we should all welcome and, and a duty that um, requires um, places like the Maxwell School who are teaching about citizenship and about the obligations of citizenship in this, in this great country. So I will stop there, and I look forward very much to answering your questions and answering questions from the provost. Thank you. Well, I think you really started us off beautifully in letting us know what an important conversation this is at this moment. And I just want to begin by uh, saying how honored I am to be here with you. And as someone who cares deeply about American democracy, I want to personally thank you for standing thank up you. for thank the rule you. of law. And the so this has been an amazing couple of years, right? Uh, you are someone who hails from Republican royalty, so wow. to speak, <laughs> right? Your father was uh, the, the congressman, Republican congressman from Wyoming. He was uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, he was Vice President. Your mother uh, ran the National Endowment for Humanities. She's a longtime senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and author of many books, uh, really core central figures. And you yourself, of course, have had a distinguished career as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, as Congresswoman, someone rising through the ranks to the third position in the House, and I think many people thought that you were a likely next Speaker of the House. And then it all changed. And it all changed because we had a president who did not accept the outcome of an election and because of the events of January 6th. And because you said, in the context of all that, that you would support impeachment of President Trump, and you agree to serve on the select committee investigating January 6th. And in response to all of that, you were stripped of your leadership position. The National Republican Party uh, 
endeavored to censure you, and you have just lost the primary for your seat in the House. Should we be surprised by all this? Well, yes. <laughs> um, I think that it is um, in many ways inexplicable um, that, uh, that we are where we are um, and that circumstances that are so clearly indefensible, um, you know, Donald Trump sending a mob he knew was angry and he knew was armed to the Capitol uh, in an attempt to stop the counting of electoral votes is so clearly indefensible that it is inexplicable to me that so many in my party are defending it. And I think that um, you know we have seen that at so many moments uh, over the course uh, of the last year and a half or so. And, and I, I think that what is so important is for people to understand and recognize that, um, that there is a real cost to the republic of, of defending behavior that is simply constitutionally indefensible. And, and the cost of it is um, a, a, a constant chipping away at the foundations uh, of the country. And when you defend a behavior like that, it you know, increasingly becomes acceptable, increasingly becomes perceived um, uh, as allowable. And you know, we, we cannot be a country where elections are determined by violence. And so, you know, when you have a situation where people who um, know that that's the case, they know that um, the election was not stolen, they know that the outcome could not have been changed on January 6th, uh, are, are excusing the activity and enabling uh, the former president. It, it is a dangerous and, um, and stunningly surprising situation. And as you reflect on it, what, what do you think this means about the current state of the Republican Party, about the future of the Republican Party? You know, I, um, I really believe in what the party um, used to stand for. And in the months um, and, and weeks just after January 6th, um, you know, we as a party had a decision to, to make, and uh, I was then chairwoman of the conference, and um, we had, you know, multiple um, meetings of our conference in that time period. And um, when I look back and I think about the discussions we were having and, you know, the extent to which, um, you know, I was saying we have to make a choice. You know, we, we either are going to continue to be the party of Lincoln and of Reagan, um, the party that believes in, uh, you know, the, a strong national defense and um, the preeminence of the individual and limited government. We're either going to embrace those ideology, those ideological principles on which we were built, um, or we're going to go down a path of embracing insurrection and excusing it and, um, you know, warning about how dangerous that would be. And I think you have to say, if anything, um, the embrace of, uh, of insurrection, the embrace of uh, the lies about the election um, have gotten worse and more widespread since then. So uh, I think that, that the party itself um, has to get back to a place where uh, we're able to say, this is what we stand for, this is why people should vote for us, this is what we believe in, and being able to convey to people that they can, they can trust us. And I think we have a long way to go. Um, and of course, it is the case that people from across the political spectrum have respected and applauded um, the course that you've taken, the, the principled path that you've pursued. 
Uh, but I have to ask, as a lifelong Republican, how painful is it to have liberal Democrats in your fan club now? <laughs> I'm not choosy these days, no. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, uh, look, I, I think that when you look at uh, the select committee, for example, and uh, again, you know, to me, there, there was never a question that we have to investigate the worst attack on the Capitol since the War of 1812. And when initially, I think everyone said the ideal solution is this bipartisan outside commission. Um, and the Democrats gave us in the House everything we wanted. You know, Leader McCarthy told John Katko, Representative Katko, who uh, is a very principled member of Congress, um, to go negotiate the terms of this bipartisan commission to investigate the attack. Uh, Representative Katko did and got everything that he asked for, a complete bipartisanship, even split, even split with respect to subpoena power, no sitting members of Congress, got everything we asked, and then Leader McCarthy pulled the rug out from under him. So the Bipartisan Commission passed the House with 35 Republicans supporting it, and, and the Democrats, and then it was killed in the Senate again by the Republicans. So the Bipartisan Commission died, and then the question is, are you gonna investigate the attack or not? Um, and and it, to me, there's no, no question. Um, and so our committee that is investigating the attack um, is made up of seven Democrats and two Republicans. And, you know, I have to say that the extent to which, and it's not just the members of the committee, but it is Americans all across the country, um, the, the recognition that some things are above politics, and we can disagree deeply about policy issues, but we never get to have the debate about tax policy or um, defense strategy uh, or any of those other issues if you let the constitutional framework unravel. And so we have to come together as Americans, um, regardless of party, to defend fundamentally the framework and the structure um, that guarantees our freedom. And that is also, of course, how you pursued your reelection campaign, uh, in the framework of a commitment, a continued commitment to defend the republic. And I want to ask you about one incredibly striking moment in that campaign, which was your father's political ad. Um, and I don't know how many in the audience have seen this ad. It's, it's quite something. In the ad, your father looks straight into the camera and says, in our 246 year history, there has never been an individual who is a greater threat to our republic than Donald Trump. It's a stunning moment. This is a former Republican vice president talking about a former Republican president. Can you talk a little bit about how that ad came to be? Was it scripted? Was it planned? So um, it, it was planned to be uh, an ad like many we've made in my other campaigns. You know, my mom and dad had just cast their votes that day uh, in early voting and voted for me. I was very proud. <laughs> there are about eight other people who voted for me too. But <laughs> um, uh, and, and so the ad was just going to be, you know, uh, I'm Dick Cheney and I voted for my daughter Liz and, and I hope you will as well. And then as we started filming, uh, he said, you know, I have a few other things I'd like to say. And um, he, it, those are his words, and he, he's very, very troubled. Um, and as somebody both who um, has obviously served um, in elected office and, and in appointed office, and um, as somebody who's a student of history, I think, you know, f for him, um, 
to, to make that point that there's no individual who's been a greater danger um, is, is something that I, th I think uh, and I, I hope people will take very seriously because um, it, it, it's a very informed and educated assessment about the threats our nation has faced in, you know, in our 246 year history. Um, I want to talk about bipartisan friendship for a minute. I, I recently watched, there's a great interview with you uh, that Evan Smith conducted at the Texas Tribune Festival. And during the course of this interview, you, you talk about a couple of your fellow committee members, um, Jamie Raskin, uh, Zoe Lofgren, uh, who are both Democrats, and you talk about them with clearly respect and appreciation. And I've also seen interviews with them where those sentiments are clearly returned. And it was striking to me hearing that because we're not in a moment where we hear that very much, right? And it, it made me think back to a time when we had important bipartisan friendships, alliances, if you think about Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, if you think about Warren Hatch and Ted Kennedy, that were important to looking after the long-term interests of the nation. Why is it that it seems so unusual now to have that? Yeah, I, I, it is a, it's a unique, um, moment in terms of, of our committee. Um, and I think first of all, the certainly the vitriol and the toxicity in our politics has reached a level that I think we all have to step back from. Um, and, and I admit that, you know, I myself, you may not have noticed, I've engaged in pretty partisan um, politics um, on a number of occasions. And and I think that, that all of us have to step back. You know, it, it can be very easy when you're in Congress um, to sort of say, okay, this bill is gonna be on the floor, what are the talking points? You know, what are the Democratic talking points? What are the Republican talking points? And um, we also, because of social media, um, I I'm think, ask about that next. okay, um, <laughs> but it has certainly contributed to, to toxicity. And um, I think that we saw on January 6th um, that words matter. Um, we um, have to recognize that in, in the world in which we're living today, um, uh, political violence increasingly is becoming Part of, um, part of part of our politics, and and it it cannot be that way. And we all have to be responsible for our words. Um, you know, when you see uh, former President Trump just in the last 24 hours uh, suggesting in a pretty thinly veiled way, um, using words that that could well cause violence against the Republican leader of the Senate, saying he has a death wish and then um, you know, launching an absolutely despicable racist attack against Secretary Chow, uh, Leader McConnell's wife. Uh, and then you watch the fact that nobody in my party will say that's unacceptable. Um, and everybody ought to be asked whether or not that's acceptable. And everybody ought to be able to say no, that is not acceptable. They ought to be required to say that. Um, but I think that we've come to accept a level of, of venom in our politics um, that is very dangerous. Um, what we've done on the select committee, I think in a number of ways, um, you know, uh, I hope will be a model. Um, you know, we decided, for example, that we would not have a situation where, you know, in every hearing, every member speaks for five minutes um, we, we decided it was very important to deal in substance to be able to present to the American people the testimony of Republicans um, who have been very clear that the election wasn't stolen, that they told President Trump it wasn't stolen. 
uh, his attorney general, his White House counsel, the head of his campaign. Um, we also don't launch political attacks at each other you know, on the dais while the hearings are underway, or really at all. And, and I think that, you know, I think that this is a place where the voters really have power. And the issue is, you know, what, what behavior will we all incentivize and reward? And we all, if you think about what you demand from people you hire or people you work with in, in you know, your everyday lives, um, you demand excellence and honesty, and, and character matters, really matters, especially in elected officials. And um, I think those ought to be the criteria by which we, we make decisions when we go vote. And I think um, it's, it's really important uh, not to incentivize the kind of, of partisan toxicity that, that has come to characterize too much of, of how we conduct ourselves these days. Uh, so the question becomes, how do we get there? Uh, and, and you've spoken eloquently about courage, as you did in your opening remarks. You've spoken about the courage of the Capitol Police in their work to defend the Capitol that day. You've spoken about the courage of state elected officials who resisted the pressure that was put on them not to certify the outcome of the election, uh, people like Rusty Bowers in Arizona. You've spoken about the courage of the witnesses who have come forward um, before the select committee, many of them Republicans, people like Cassidy Hutchinson, uh, and her courage in telling the truth and understanding some of the costs that that would bring. And of course, We've all admired your own court courage in much of this. But I guess my question is, is courage enough, right? Uh, let's imagine that um, the former president decided to disappear from public life. Uh, would we then have a healthy democracy? Are there other things that we would have to address that are contributing to the moment that we're in. I, uh, I went to a talk the other day and the speaker was talking about media. And uh, he made the comment that if you watch Fox News and CNN, it's like heroin. It's actually somebody who's uh, written about um, the heroin crisis in the country. And he said it was like heroin because it convinces us always that we at our group are right. It never questions the common sense of a particular position. And it fuels outrage. Would we have to do something to address social media and the polarized um, news that we have in order to recover a healthy democracy? Well, certainly. Um, you know, I think there are so many pieces to, to this issue. Um, you know, I think first of all, um, we, we need to all take responsibility for educating ourselves. And I think one of the most important things we need to do is educate ourselves, educate our children, educate our friends and family um, about what it means to be a nation of laws. And you know, the, there are phrases that people sometimes say, like we're a nation of laws, you know, not a nation of men. And we need to all stop and think about what that means. Um, and, and what that means is fundamentally, um, you know, we abide by the rulings of our courts. And one of the most dangerous and destructive things that Donald Trump did uh, was go to war with the rule of law. Um, a, a president um, has a duty um, to ensure that the laws are faithfully executed. He has a duty uh, above everybody else um, to defend and protect the Constitution, but in particular to ensure the laws are faithfully executed. And so, what that means is that um, 
you know, discussions about my view or my opinion about, you know, you know, there are a number of Republicans now who will say things like, and look, we've had claims made on the other side too. Well, I just feel that the election was stolen or I just believe that there was so much fraud it would have changed the outcome. Um, that isn't how our system can work or survive. And I ask people, imagine if the, the situation were reversed and if a candidate that you opposed were saying, well, I just feel like there was fraud. Um, we have a system in which if you believe that there has been fraud in an election, you have an obligation, you, you, you have the ability to go to court, but you have an obligation to produce evidence. And you can't just claim it, and you can't just assert that the votes of millions of people should be thrown out because you feel like there was fraud. You have to prove it. And in 61 out of 62 cases, including many that were decided by judges Donald Trump appointed, the court said, you have not shown the evidence. You have not proven this. In fact, what you're asking us to do in terms of disenfranchising millions of people, in some cases, would be clearly un-American based upon these allegations that you're making. So, you know, when we think about what our responsibility and our duty is, we absolutely have a First Amendment right for vigorous debate, for vigorous argument. It's foundational. Um, but we also have a responsibility to the truth. And I think, I think our news media has a huge responsibility. Um, you know, when I watch Fox News night after night after night, taking Russia's side on some of their programs in, in you know, the invasion of Ukraine, um, pushing Russian propaganda, pushing propaganda that the election was stolen. Um, it does make you wonder whose side are they on here? It does not seem to be America's. And again, you know, people have a First Amendment right. They have the right to say what they believe, but but news outlets have a duty and an obligation to ask themselves, why are we giving a platform to these perspectives and these very dangerous views? Um, and I, I do think when you look at social media, and you look at Twitter, and you look at Facebook, um, you know, th those, those companies have a responsibility as well. And when they have algorithms, as we know they do, that drive people into more and more radical places and more and more divisiveness, um, you know, that, that creates a real danger for the country. And, and I think that, um, you know, all of the divisiveness is what we know our adversaries are trying to encourage. Uh, we know that the Chinese and the Russians would love nothing more and in fact are encouraging us um, to be engaged in this battle with each other. And I think it's, it's it's incumbent on us, both in terms of who we vote for and support, in terms of the um, you know, social media companies in which we're uh, you know, on the, those platforms, incumbent upon all of us to um, have a commitment to the truth, to finding out the truth. And that can be harder and harder these days. But you know, again, I think it um, bringing it back to the January 6th committee for a minute and to our hearings, uh, I hear colleagues of mine say things like, oh, well, the hearings, like, got, you know, those have been just partisan. And then you say, well, have you watched any of them? It's, well, no, but, you know, just they've been partisan. And I, I would urge everybody to watch them. Um, watch them, listen to what the vast majority of witnesses, you know, they're Republicans, listen to what they're saying, and then make your determination about it. And I, I, I think you're offering a good reminder um, of the role of businesses, of the role of media, also the role of universities and uh, the role that we need to play in encouraging civil discourse and growing that commitment to citizenship. That, can I just say yes. something about it? It's so, so important and, um, uh, you know, one of the things that um, we don't do very well in this country uh, anymore is teach American history and, and teach the duties of citizenship. And I, I say that as uh, the mother of five, uh, someone who's um, you know, watched my kids uh, in different schools, um, 
you know, go through uh, social studies classes and, and uh, learn about sort of America's role in the world. And one of the real challenges and one of the reasons why I think places like the Maxwell School are so important is because when you're a citizen in the United States, um, you know, you, are, you have a duty and a responsibility and you have to be prepared for that. Um, you know, citizens of the United States, um, our citizenship um, is based upon a, a set of fundamental beliefs about freedom and about inalienable rights. Um, you know, the only nation in the world that was founded on those ideals. And so, um, you know, being in a position to ensure that, that, you know, you're equipped to hand this republic off to the next generation requires understanding and, and being educated about, um, about what it means to be an American. And uh, Abraham Lincoln um, talked about uh, how a nation can't remain both uh, free and ignorant. Okay. Our freedom Absolutely. is based upon uh, education. And, and it's really important that we find a way in our country okay. to get back to um, making sure that, that our citizens are equipped with that education. I agree 100%, and you also just made the Dean of the Maxwell School very happy. <laughs> um, uh, speaking of, of rights, I want to ask you a question about gay marriage. Now, your own views on this topic have evolved. You famously, the first time you ran for office, expressed a position in opposition to gay marriage. More recently, you have expressed your support for gay marriage. And you uh, express that just at a moment when many um, conservatives are pulling back from supporting gay marriage. And at a moment, um, if you take a look at the Thomas concurring opinion in Dobbs, where it's not clear that it is a right that is constitutionally secure. What would you say to the people who care about this, about um, the future of this right, and, and what reflections might you offer on your own evolution on this issue? Well, I um, uh, obviously this is an issue that touches my own family, um, and uh, I believe um, that freedom means freedom for everybody. Uh, I believe that, that we have to protect the rights of um, people to marry uh, who they love. Um, I've said that I, I was wrong on this issue. Uh, and it is a, it's a painful issue to talk about um, because it is one that involves my family. Um, that must have been but, a fun Thanksgiving. Well, I mean, it, it's, um, uh, I, I love my sister um, and, I, and I love her family very much. and. Um, I think that I think that on this issue, um, as on many of the issues that we're we're dealing with today as a country, um, it's really incumbent upon public officials and political leaders to address these issues with compassion and to address these issues as human beings. Yeah. And I think that too often we get into um, battles about social issues especially, because they, the, the, these are issues about which people care deeply. Um, but I think that, um, that as a nation it would be um, a big mistake for us to go down the path uh, that Justice Thomas laid out in his concurrence to Dobbs. Um, and, and I think it's, it's important that we um, respect the right of people to marry who they love. Uh, and the last question I'll give you, um, you were recently given a Profile in Courage Award by the John F. Kennedy Library, and in your speech and accepting the award, you recalled a speech that Kennedy had given in 1963. And uh, it was about the value of public service. And summarizing, you told the audience that Kennedy had explained, quote, 
that the ancient Greeks defined happiness as the full use of your power along lines of excellence and told the students who were there that day that there was no more excellence pursuit than service to our country. And then you shared that one of the students in the audience who'd been inspired by that speech was your father. Uh, and Syracuse University, as you have noted, has a long and proud commitment um, to encouraging public service and to honoring those who have served. Maxwell School has been encouraging gave citizenship for almost 100 years. The Daniello Institute for Veterans and Military Families is here to support those in our community who have served as veterans. And yet, we live in a moment in which fewer and fewer of our students are sure about that path of getting into public service. And when I think about your own example, it's on the one hand an example of incredible public service, and it's also a bit of a cautionary tale of the potential cost of that service. What would you say to our students today who are wrestling with that issue? I would say um, that there's no more important thing that, that you can do um, than, than serving. And it, certainly, you know, uh, as I said before, the, those who make the highest sacrifice are those who put on the uniform of this nation. Um, but there are uh, ways to serve and... Um, and, and, and crucial um, and consequential ways to serve, um, whether it's in your community, whether it is um, you know, at the state level, whether it is you know, running for office, uh, for federal office. Um, and I also think that while um, we talk about the challenges of it, uh, it, it's also just, you know, it, it's an incredible blessing and I think about the work that I did for a number of years before I was elected to Congress, serving in countries around the world where people aren't free. And you know, I had the incredible opportunity to meet people. Um, like at the time, he was a young man. His name was Boris Nemtsov, and uh, in 1992, he was the mayor of a town in Russia called Nizhny Novgorod. And I was working to help to support privatization of small businesses in Russia. And so we, we looked to find a town where there was a mayor who really wanted to reform. And we thought we could make that a model. And, and that's the town that we went to. And um, he was incredibly inspiring. And he believed in freedom for his people. And he fought for decades in Russia for freedom. And he was ultimately killed um, by thugs sent by Vladimir Putin. And, and I would just say that, you know, we take for granted sometimes in the United States what, what it means to live in freedom. Um, but, but if you want to understand, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln called America an inestimable jewel worth defending. And, and if you think about what it means um, to be in a position where, where you can help to pass this freedom on to the next generation, and you think about people who, you know, are fighting in Ukraine today for their freedom. And you think about the sacrifices that so many people around the world and so many people in the United States have made for freedom. Um, it, it, is, uh, it, it is a noble thing to determine that you're gonna serve your country. And it's also, um, it's also required. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier about one of the things that I hear sometimes, especially from my Republican colleagues, is January 6th wasn't all that bad. And it wasn't all that bad because the institutions held. And whenever anybody says that, I tell them the institutions only held because there were individuals who took their responsibility to the Constitution seriously because there were people like Rusty Bowers, because there were people like Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, election workers, because there were people like uh, 
Raffensperger who refused the pressure from Donald Trump. It only held because of people. And while our government sometimes can seem huge, and it is, it's too big, um, while, <laughs> I'm a Republican, <laughs> um, but, but while it can seem huge and while it can seem impossible to make a difference, um, the lesson of January 6th is that the only thing that makes a difference is people. And we need every single um, good and honorable person of character to step forward and serve the country. And, um, and, and so I just, uh, I can't encourage you more as young people here today watching um, that we need you um, and that it is, uh, it, it's, it's crucial for the survival of the republic. So I really, I hope you will continue your interest in public service and that you will decide that you're gonna serve this country. Uh, I, I will say with all the challenges that, that we face, uh, one of the things that gives me hope is those young people. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, and I think we've got some more questions that we have been do. sent in. We had the great good fortune to be able to solicit questions from the audience ahead of time to be able to use Congresswoman Cheney's time efficiently and Provost, speaking of efficiency, you are done right on 3.30, perfect timing. <laughs> Congresswoman Cheney, in his book, The Death of Expertise, Tom Nichols talks about a generalized defiance toward established knowledge. And he observes that citizens seem intent on punishing experts and elites as part of a larger flight from reason and responsibility. Nichols goes on to say, knowledge is not self-explanatory and education is not easy. This questioner asks, how do we restore public confidence and debunk the view that there are alternative facts? Hmm. It's, a, it's a really important question. And, um, you know, I think I look at this from the perspective partly uh, of um, Wyoming. And there certainly is a frustration. I mean, I, if you think about, if you're a, a rancher in Wyoming who has been, you know, visited by, um, uh, you know, people from the Environmental Protection Agency who are making demands on you and insisting that, you know, your land is, um, you know, somehow, uh, you know, in a protected area or watershed area, <coughs> bureaucrats in Washington 2,000 miles away making decisions about people's lives is very frustrating and is wrong in, in a number of instances. And so I understand, um, I understand the frustration with bureaucracy and I think that, that certainly feeds um, some of the, the concern. Um, but I do think that we have to recognize that that frustration with how big the federal government is and the frustration with you know, unelected officials making decisions about people's lives can't, can't be taken to this extreme of rejecting education, um, you know, uh, of rejecting reasoned thought and argument. Um, I see it in the House of Representatives. You know, it's much, much easier just to launch an angry tweet at a colleague full of talking points than it is to actually have a reasoned debate about issues. And um, the colleagues that I respect the most um, are colleagues on both sides of the aisle who do their homework. So, you know, I know that if I'm gonna be having a debate about energy policy uh, or a debate about, you know, the defense budget, there are certain members that I know, man, if they're on the other side of this debate, I better do my homework because they will have done theirs. And the country benefits so much more from those kinds of, of reasoned exchanges and debates. And, and when you're looking for people to vote for, um, you know, you ought to really dig in and, and understand their perspective and force them to answer those substantive questions because that, those are the kinds of people you want representing you. 
Well, I appreciate you asking about energy policy and to the audience, I did not share these questions with the Congresswoman ahead of time, but here's another question that fits perfectly <laughs> within that. Climate change is an area where there continues to be debate about evidence, degree of change, and the types of global, national, and local interventions that should be mandated. How would you counsel this audience about what we may have to do to convince doubters and deniers that the consequences of climate change are happening now? I think that uh, this is another area where we have to have fidelity to facts. And, um, and I think that on both sides of this issue, people make assertions that are sometimes untethered from, from science. Um, you know, I look at what the United States of America um, can do in terms of energy production. And the extent to which when we produce energy in the United States, uh, fossil fuels uh, in particular, it's the cleanest energy in the world. Uh, it's the cleanest use of fossil fuels in the world. We have tremendous advances that we've made as well in things like carbon capture, uh, carbon sequestration. And too often what happens in the debate uh, and I, again, I've seen this as a representative from Wyoming, that um, those people who believe that we should move immediately to renewable energy overlook all of the advances that we've made in technology in the United States. And when you put policies in place that make it harder for us to produce our own energy in the United States, uh, the immediate result of that is that you are making us dependent upon countries that have policies that are abhorrent to us and countries that don't produce energy as cleanly as we do. And so I think that we all need to have a recognition of um, you know, what impact uh, is human behavior having on climate change? What impact do our policies actually have on climate change? Um, we have to be honest about that. And, and I think from a national security perspective, as well as an ec economic perspective, um, we need to be energy independent. And uh, that means, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't pursue policies that make it harder for us to produce cleaner energy in the United States and make us dependent upon other, other places. I think that ultimately doesn't serve objectives of anybody in terms of the, the climate debate. Some commentators and more than a few citizens believe that the current challenges to democracy are rooted in an erosion of civics education in schools, something that you and Provost Ritter spoke about. But at the same time, there are more and more challenges that parents know better what their children should be taught and equally important what they should not be taught. What is your perspective on a revised role for the federal government in curriculum development? And should there be some degree of oversight of what is taught in college? And if so, why? So I, um, I don't think um, that we ought to be in the business of having the federal government play a larger role in, in imposing requirements in education. I think that we do need to think about that from a constitutional perspective. Um, and, and again, this is partly from my own experience as a parent. Uh, you know, our oldest daughter is uh, 27. And, m you know, my experience largely has been, and this has been, you know, both uh, schools in Wyoming and schools in Virginia, um, that the parents, we're the ones that are actually teaching American history. And the, the curriculum, um, what's happening at school, you know, too often our children are not being taught the greatness of America. Now, America is far from perfect, um, and, and our children need to understand that, but we're the most perfect nation that's ever existed. And, um, you know, I've, I think it's important for parents to have a role, and I think parents are ultimately our children's most important educators. Um, and I think that 
uh, local decision making and empowering teachers, uh, empowering good teachers is especially important. Um, if you think about how we all learn, um, we all probably can remember teachers we loved, and, and those are teachers who ha are passionate about what they're teaching, and they inspire us, and usually, when it comes to history, they're, they're you know, teaching us the stories of great men and women. And we just don't do enough of that anymore. I think our teachers are burdened with uh, you know, curriculum requirements. Our kids are burdened with standardized testing requirements, all of which take away from time spent on a deep love of the subject matter. Um, and, and too often our kids are taught that America is a force for ill in the world. And, and I think that that's a really dangerous thing. Our, our kids need to be taught about the greatness of this nation. They need to be taught about um, the, the flaws of our nation. But they need to understand that the way that we've overcome those, the tragedies in our history, the way that we've overcome um, the flaws in this nation is through the Constitution. That, that it's the Constitution itself that through our amendment process and through fidelity uh, to the founding principles that, that guarantees our rights and freedoms. So this question is to take you out of your legislative role, but more with the fact that you have a great cross-section of experience. One of the challenges often associated with universities is that the faculty is not considered to be politically and ideologically diverse. Universities frequently assert that they are more diverse than is often publicly acknowledged, but the only information they're required to collect from a compliance perspective in the hiring process is race and ethnicity, and gender data, and that to request other types of information would be an infringement on individual privacy. What do you believe a university should do to address the criticism that the faculty are not diverse in the way described? Well, I think that, that we face a, a, a real challenge on college campuses uh, with cancel culture. And, um, when, when young people get to college, uh, you know, they, they should have their beliefs challenged and they should be forced to engage in debates and decide whether or not you know, the ideals and beliefs you came with are ones that you really can defend and you should have your, your mind open to other perspectives and debates. Um, but too often today, there are views that are canceled. And, um, I think that, that that's, that's really dangerous. And I think if you, if you think about our growth as a country, um, you, you know, you think about um, sort of fundamentally what you want young people to get out of being at college, it's um, an education that teaches them how to think about the future and how to, how to think about their role in, in our country and their role in the world. And, um, I, I think it's very important that we do everything we can to protect against, you know, the cancellation of it happens to be conservative views uh, on too many campuses these days. Um, I, I think people ought to be challenged, and and I think it's important that that those that colleges be an atmosphere where your fundamental beliefs uh, can be challenged and where you learn from from the kind of intellectual engagement and debate. This question comes from a student who was willing to be identified, <laughs> Brian Tyler Carr, an undergraduate from the Whitman School of Management. You'll be sorry. <laughs> How will the January 6th committee determine who should get a criminal referral after the investigations are completed? It's a very good question. Um, so part of our responsibility, um, uh, our duty is um, if in the course of our investigation uh, it um, becomes clear that there was criminal activity, then, then you know, we make criminal referrals. And uh, so those are, are the, that process is one that, that we're discussing now. Um, and uh, I don't want to go too far down the path in terms of specifics about it, but 
Uh, it's something I can tell you all of the members of the committee take seriously. And um, I also think it's clear, I mean, it, if you look at what the Justice Department uh, is doing based upon public reporting, um, that they also take very seriously uh, the attack. Uh, it's the largest criminal investigation in American history. Um, right now, as we sit here today, uh, the, there's a trial of a number of Oath Keepers um, that's begun in Washington that, who are charged with seditious uh, conspiracy. Um, there was a very important uh, sentencing decision that was made last week uh, by Judge Amy Berman Jackson. And, and I would encourage everyone to read uh, the transcript because um, this was a sentencing of uh, the individual who brutally attacked uh, Officer Fanon on January 6th. And the, the, the transcript of this hearing includes his description of what happened to him that day. Um, and it also includes her warnings about um, the former president's continued uh, encouragement of, of violence. Um, and and it, it has in it a timeline, and I, I think it's important for people to think about this timeline. Um, on the west front of the Capitol on January 6th, um, the Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police repelled an attack of thousands and thousands of people. If, if they had not held that door which is the door presidents walk through when they're being inaugurated into office. And if they hadn't held that door, we would have had a, a far worse constitutional crisis. And part of holding that door involved the Metropolitan Police arriving and, and forming a line, basically as though they were in combat, because they were. Um, and the, the timeline is that at 224, Donald Trump sent his tweet out saying Mike Pence doesn't have the courage to do what needs to be done, 224. And at 2.30, that Metropolitan Police line broke. It's the first time in the history of the Metropolitan Police Force that a, a line broke, and they had to conduct a fighting withdrawal. It's also the first time in history that ever happened, six minutes after Donald Trump sent the tweet saying Mike Pence isn't gonna do what needs to be done, he doesn't have the courage the thousands of people surged against the Capitol. And, and I, I think it's very important for people to understand um, that timeline. So um, the, 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 my, my point in, in explaining all of that is that there's already very important activity underway by the Justice Department uh, on a whole range of fronts in terms of the criminal activity that took place. And, um, the committee will, will make these decisions, and, and my anticipation is that, that the decisions will be uh, unanimous uh, as we go forward. In this final question from Professor Peggy Thompson, who teaches a popular course on the presidency, she writes, especially since January 6th, you have established a reputation as someone who is willing to speak truth to power and to buck your party's establishment. Who, if any, do you see as possible contenders among Republicans to fill that role in the future? And secondly, do you see any House Democrats about whom this could also be said within their party? Uh, I hesitate to name people. I'm not sure it will help them if I name them. <laughs> um, but look, I, um, I, do have, I do have real hope and optimism. Um, that, that, that the country will find people who, um, who will lead with integrity and with character. And, um, and there are certainly uh, people on both sides of the aisle today who represent that. Um, I think it has to be said that, that the current leadership of the Republican Party uh, in the Congress, in the House, uh, and a number in the Senate are, are not leading that way. Um, but, but I, I think that, um, that our history is characterized by um, moments where um, people put the country first and um, did, did what was right. Um, one of my sons 
is uh, in a, a forensics class in which they have to memorize speeches. And he happens to be uh, memorizing uh, Al Gore's concession speech um, in 2000. And uh, again, this is a, you know, I, I obviously was a very hard fought campaign. Al Gore and I have a lot of disagreements on policy. I'm glad that campaign and election turned out the way it did. But go watch Al Gore's concession speech. Um, it's worth the time. And, and as my son has been practicing it, um, it's very moving uh, because um, Vice President Gore, I'm, I'm sure it was a very painful speech for him to give, um, but he captures um, how important it is. He says that, that the Supreme Court has ruled. He says, make no mistake, I disagree you know, intensely, firmly with how the Supreme Court ruled. But in this nation, it's our honored institutions of democracy that determine the outcome of our elections. And, and I think that, that the vast majority of Americans on both sides of the aisle believe in the honored institutions of our democracy. And we'll get through this period, and we will elect people who are going to defend those. Congresswoman Cheney, Provost Ritter, thank you so much for such an enlightening conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.